Today we're in Acts chapter 2. I want to share with you concerning the church that Jesus builds. And uh, today we're going to look at the subject of prayer. So in verse 42 it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, as we've been seeing in this passage here, when we come to the Lord, we will openly identify with him in baptism. We'll be open to receiving instruction concerning the things of God. We become part of a new community of like-minded people, and we celebrate communion together. Those are the initial elements of beginning our walk with the Lord. That's what I learned when I first came to Christ. I learned that when I first came to Christ, that uh, there were some essential things that would help me to understand uh, what it means to be a Christian. See, prior to coming to faith in the Lord, if you'd have asked me what is a Christian and what does a Christian do, I wouldn't have had an answer for either one of those questions. But as I got saved and I began to be discipled and encouraged in the things of the Lord, I was told that there were certain things that would help me to grow in my faith in Jesus Christ. These are the basic things that every person in this room who is saved uh, already knows. I was encouraged, for example, to read the Bible. I was encouraged to have Christian fellowship. I was was encouraged to share my faith. I was also encouraged to learn to pray. So prayer was an essential part of my earliest days of following the Lord, and and prayer obviously remains so. I mean, it is so common in the church. It is such an essential practice that none of us in this room even notice how much prayer goes on even during a service. Think about it for just a moment. You know how we began this this, uh, Wednesday night study. It began not with singing. It began with prayer, and prayer punctuated the entire worship service. Even as I'm coming up here, I begin with prayer. It is such an essential, it's such a, a basic thing. I'll be, honest, I'll be honest with you, many of us don't even realize how much we pray, even in our Bible studies and regular services. It's just part of what we do. It's part of being a believer. It's something that we as Christians have been taught to do from the very beginning. And so uh, the early church had certain earmarks that distinguished it, and and these things, like, like the teaching, the desiring of teaching, by the way, and I want you to see that in verse 42, when it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And there was a desire for teaching. And I, I could go off on that. I'm not supposed to because that's not what I prepared today. But even as I'm sharing that right now, that, that idea that there's a desire to be taught the word of God, that is an essential that really identif- identifies us as being Christians. I, I, I did a wedding uh, a while back now, and, and somebody uh, complained about the wedding. Now, that's interesting. I mean, people complain about a lot of things. But to complain about a wedding, but you want to know what was interesting? That, that their complaint was it was too religious. Yeah, that, isn't that trivia? I mean, but, but that's what has happened in our time. And so, see, a lot of times, guys, when I'm talking to you, I, it's like I'm saying, you already know this, and you do. And you do. This is not some kind of revolutionary study. You've never, oh, this is, let me take notes. This is just really impactful. No, these are things that you know. But sometimes we need to rehearse those things. We need to revisit those things. And sometimes we need to return to those things. Because they're the things that we can walk away from over time, thinking we already know that. I've already heard that. And when we get to the point where we say, I've already heard that, tell me something new and something fresh, that's when we become open to false teaching. That's when we become open to error because we want to hear something novel. And very often the novel is not true. And so they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That was the essential. It's from that place that they were able to grow in their faith in Christ. There are people today... Who will knock on your door and, uh, or will stand in front of, you know, Winchell's or whatever with magazines? And um, they will argue with you things about God. They'll say things like, Jesus Christ is Michael the archangel. 
or they'll say Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. They'll say things like that to you. And a lot of believers, a lot of believers will buy into that. But I would, I would encourage you in this. I would encourage you to understand that those things that they're saying to you cannot be found in Scripture. You can read the Bible from cover to cover, and you can read it a hundred times, and you will never find anywhere in the Bible that ever says that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. You'll never find anywhere in Scripture, and you can read it from Genesis to Revelation, or Revelation to Genesis if you want, or anything in between, and you will never find that Jesus Christ is proclaimed to be the spirit brother of Lucifer. You'll never find that. But why do so many people believe those kinds of things? They believe it because they're not, they're not remaining steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Because somebody is imposing those things on Scripture and then telling people who don't read the Bible that these things are so. And so what keeps you safe, guys? Stay in the Word of God. And that's what they did. They read their Bibles. They were actually, they would read the Word of God, but they also had it taught to them in apostolic instruction. That was just simply part of what they were learning. That was the essentials of the beginning of the, or walk with the Lord. And so there were things like that. They desired teaching. They desired fellowship. If you don't want to hang around with Christians because we're boring, and we are sometimes, we can be to, to some, ah, you're boring, you're so boring. Then maybe, maybe we're drinking water from the, from the wrong well. And when, when you don't really care that much about the other things that are so important to the Lord, the, the communion service, or it doesn't matter whether you've been baptized. This, that's something to really think about. You see, the desire for these kinds of things is one of the ways that a person can know that they're saved. It, it reveals a transformed person, one who has a new, a new nature, and because they have a new nature, they have a new hunger. And the most dominant hunger that they have that everything else is going to be built on is their hunger for the Lord. Like it says in Psalm 63, verse 1, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread, uh, naturally would include times of prayer. Those are the most basic marks of a Christian congregation. Believers in God would naturally be lovers of prayer. And the Bible is filled with examples of this kind of expression of faith. There's a, a, a writer by the name of Dr. Herbert Lockyer. Some of you perhaps have heard of him. He's written uh, various books that are called All, The All of the, and then the subject is found. Is that for me? <laughs> Hope that's Jesus, bro. <laughs> Dr. Lockyer wrote a book. It's called All the Prayers of the Bible. In his book, he counted 650 prayers that were prayed, that are recorded in Scripture. So obviously, prayer was and is an essential expression of faith and our relationship to God. I was reading just today that every book of the Bible contains prayers that have been recorded. Acts is what has been called the blueprint for the church. It records the birth of the church, and it gives the foundations of the early church. And the book of Acts very, very clearly reveals that the early church was a praying church. Even before the day of Pentecost, it was a habit of the early uh, believers to pray faithfully. If you looked even at chapter 1, I'm not necessarily encouraging you to, but it's just a page away. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, notice it will say there, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. You see, it's interesting to note, prayer is such an essential and so powerful. And, and I'd encourage you to think of it like this, that when you look at Jesus and you look at his disciples, 
and you look at their relationship, Jesus and his relationship with his disciples, you, you can look from the, the Gospel of Matthew to the Gospel of John, and you can look for requests that were made of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's interesting to note Nowhere do you ever find the apostles ever saying to Jesus, Jesus, teach us to preach. Nowhere. Jesus, teach us to, um, to do communion, to perform weddings. The only thing you see them ever asking Jesus to teach them to do, and you know what it is, Jesus, they said, Lord, Teach us to pray. Now, isn't that interesting? They didn't say, teach us to preach. They didn't say, teach us to teach, because that's what they're supposed to do, right? I mean, when he gives a commission, he says, go out. He says, make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. But it's interesting. If you think about it for a moment, it's interesting that they never said to him, teach us how to do that. But they did say, Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is that essential. And the disciples saw that in their master. There was something about his connection with his father that these men wanted also. Teach us how to pray. Prayer in the book of Acts was made so very often that I just want to show you a few things. Prayer was made, for example, for a successor to Judas who vacated his apostolic office. You see that in Acts 1. They prayed regularly, regularly as is recorded in Acts chapter 3 when they went to the temple to pray. Acts chapter 6 verse 4 says that they gave themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Acts chapter 7, 55 through 60 records Stephen praying that Jesus would receive his spirit when he was martyred. Acts 8 records how the apostles prayed for the Samaritans to receive the baptism of the Spirit. Acts 9 speaks of God telling Ananias to minister to Paul, who was at that time praying. Acts 9 speaks of Peter praying for a woman named Tabitha as she was raised from the dead. Acts 10, Cornelius prayed and God brought salvation to his house. Acts 12, Peter was put in prison, but prayer was made for his safety and release. Acts 16, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed while in a Philippian jail. Acts 20, Paul prayed with the Ephesian elders as they wept and grieved that it was his final goodbye to them. You see prayer all through the book of Acts. Prayer is the very heartbeat of the church and is a blessing and is, is also a privilege. It is not the last thing that we do when we're in need. It's the first thing that we do always. So as Christians, we know that prayer is a conversation that we have with the Lord. It's one of the things that God calls us to do, and it's a privilege. And we need to understand that sometimes, sometimes we don't realize the privilege that it is. Children can be spoiled. I know none of ours are. I'm just speaking hypothetically about not part of our homeschool ministry. For sure, there are no spoiled kids in that. You know, Pastor Chuck Smith, my pastor, is a very blessed man, and anybody who knew him would know that. I'm just saying some things obvious. God used him in tremendous ways. Billy Graham is an amazing man, preached to more people in his lifetime than in anybody in history. But do you think that Pastor Chuck's kids knew he was Pastor Chuck Smith? That they could go to their dad at any time that they wanted? Didn't make an appointment, didn't stand in line. Just walked into his room wherever he was and said, Dad, I want to talk to you for a minute. Billy Graham. You know, Franklin and, and his sisters. Do you think they made appointments to see their dad? Do you think they ever really realized that their dad is Billy Graham? No, he's just dad. And you can take that for granted. You can take it for granted that you have access. He's your dad. You can walk into his office anytime. See, my kids, when they grew up, they grew up in the church. And when they grew up, they don't make appointments to see me. They don't knock on my door even. I wish they would sometimes, but they don't. <laughs> they just barge in. They just barge in. 
They'll swing the door in, and they bring their brats to. <laughs> That's really their ticket to get in. <laughs> so, do they realize I'm busy? I've got things I'm doing. I have to study. I have a church that I run. I've got ministry that I have to do. Do you think they ever think about it? They don't. They don't. Why don't they? They're my kids. Well, my heavenly father runs a universe. A universe. Billions of people that he oversees. And you and I call him dad. And we barge into his throne room through the blood of Christ all the time. All the, and then we even get mad at him. Because you didn't listen. You're not answering. So, think about it for a minute. It is a blessing and a privilege to call God our Father. And his door is open to us, his ear is open to us. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. It's an invitation to pray. Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8, Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Those are promises. And amazing. Amazing. You, you call the Lord, you don't get a, this is a recording. You, you, you call upon the Lord, and his ear is open unto you. The Bible says that prior to us coming to faith in Christ, before we were saved, our sins had made a separation. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. But when God drew us to himself, we had to pray. We had to pray for forgiveness. And when we did, he heard. I still remember the day I got saved. And I never realized, I, I, even as I'm remembering, as I'm speaking to you right now about it, I never realized. I just thought this was true for every, every single person. I never realized that it may be a bit different. How that after hearing that gospel message and having the invitation given and being convicted by the Spirit that I needed Christ, having that moment of honest prayer before the Lord silently in a sea of three or 4,000 young people seated on a carpet. And after hearing the invitation, if you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, stand to your feet. And there I am, one speck amongst so many. And I pray and say, God, I know I need you, but I'm too shy to stand. But if somebody would stand with me, I would stand. And as God is my witness, no sooner had those words formed themselves in my mind in the form of a prayer, Arthur Blessed, the evangelist, said, perhaps you're afraid to stand by yourself, but if somebody stood with you, would you stand? Nobody's ever been able to tell me God doesn't hear prayer. How do you explain that? How does the cynic explain that? I didn't make that up. It was just honest. I just said, God, I'm afraid to stand up. If someone stood with me, I would. Why did Arthur Blessed say that? You know, I met Arthur Blessed a couple of years ago on my birthday. I was on, I was on TV. He has a show, and he invited me to come on, and I spent some time with him. And when I told him that story, and when I told him how that happened, as I was looking at him, because he's only three feet away from me, his eyes, tears sprung into his eyes when I said that. He was so touched by that that he knew that at that moment the Holy Spirit had spoken to his heart a word he wasn't even aware that he was speaking and that it impacted me. And that all these years later, 
God had done so many things because of that one moment of obedience. God answers prayer. God hears our prayer. And he gives to us opportunity to come to him. Access to heaven is granted because of a relationship that we have through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find uh, grace to help in time of need. Jesus in John 16.24 says, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So as Christians, we know that God answers prayer because we know that God cares about us. And God has made it clear that we can bring our concerns to him. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open unto their cry. Now, I was told when I got saved, and I mentioned this at the beginning, and, and many of us can relate to this. I was told, you know, again, there are basic things that will help you to grow and be consistent in your faith in Christ. Get into the word of God. Have fellowship with Christian people. I'd give your faith away, share your faith with other people, and pray. When I went into the military, I was three months old in Christ. I got saved in December. I, got, I went into the Army in March, March 15th. And when I went into the military, I was only three months old in Christ. I was just learning the essentials and the basics of walking with Christ. And so some friends of mine and I in Fort Ord got a weekend where we, we were able to come home. One of my friends had this old Buick, I think it was like a 56 Buick. It was big enough to put several of us in it. And we started making our way from, from Fort Ord up there by Monterey. And we started coming down to, uh, to the LA County. One of my friends lived in Huntington uh, Beach. And um, I lived in Norwalk. And my friend Bill and I were coming home just for the weekend. We got a pass. And I remember this very well. I remember as we were driving in this old car that the car broke down 10 miles to the north of Santa Maria. Broke down. And it's late at night. And at that time, if you go up, up, the, up in that area ever, it's a lot different now than it was then. It was kind of like a two-lane kind of uh, place. It, it was, you know, empty. And, uh, and there we are broken down on the side of the road, and it's like 8 or 9 at night. And who's going to stop for, you know, six or seven men on the side of the road? Nobody's going to do that. It'd be crazy if you did, right? And so there we are standing on the side of the road, and I'm speaking to my friend Bill, and I'm saying, how are we going to get home? I don't know how we're going to make it home. Santa Maria, we had seen a sign, 10 miles. I thought, we're going to have to walk to Santa Maria, find a bus. You know, I'm already planning it out. And so I tell Bill, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. And Bill says, well, you know, we're just talking. So I went and I stood on the side of the road, no cars. And I start to stick my thumb out to try to hitch a ride in case a car comes by. Bill says to me, we're Christians. Now, this was when Bill thought he was a Christian. Then he thought he wasn't when he came back to the Lord later on. But anyway, we're Christians. Why don't we ask God for a ride? I, I, that made sense to me. Why not ask God for a ride? Pray about all things. So I said, yeah. So we're like, you know, we, and we've got these unbeliever friends. I mean, there's a few of them. None of them were Christians except for me and, and Bill was a professing Christian. And so we bowed our heads on the side of the road. Jesus, in your name, you know we'd like to go home. Would you please provide a ride for us? I still remember a simple prayer. Then we waited. What is he going to do? Because, listen, in the Jesus movement, when I got saved, God was moving in marvelous ways. Why not trust him? Why not? What, what's, how, is it going to hurt us to ask? It doesn't hurt, right? What's he going to do? We had this excitement. Here comes a Volkswagen down the road towards us. And they proceed past us, stop back up, and it's a young woman, young woman, it was a girl, she was 16, 17 years old, and she had her little brother who was probably 12, 13. She rolls back and stops, and they roll the window down. This is what she said, I've never forgotten. She says, I wouldn't normally do this, but I'm a Christian, and God told me to stop for you. 
And so Bill and I, ha, oh, we did the hallelujah dance. Oh, you know. <laughs> like Snoopy. <laughs> and so we piled our friends in her car, three of them. We had a lot of guys with us. Three of them climbed in her car. She says, I'll drive to Santa Maria, drop them off at the bus stop. I'll make a U-turn and come back. And if any of you others need a ride, then I'll give you a ride to the bus stop too. Praise God. Now we're all excited. Here comes another Volkswagen, a Volkswagen van, a hippie limousine. (laughs) And he pulls over. And they roll the window down, two hippies. Well, actually, one guy, the other guy, his buddy was laying in the back, because that's what you do. He was napping while this guy was driving. Hey, where are you guys going, man? We say, we're on our way to Norwalk, and this world here is going to Huntington Beach. That's where we're going. So we pile into this Volkswagen. The guy in the front driving wasn't a Christian. My friend Mike Feeney starts visiting with him. They had fellowship. There's two unbelieving pagans. <laughs> and the guy in the back was a believer. So we talked about the Lord until we fell asleep. They pulled over in Norwalk, coming out of Santa Maria, led us off by the 5 Freeway and um, Imperial Highway. We walked home, which was only a half mile. They drove my friend Mike all the way to his doorstep in Huntington Beach, God was beginning at that time to teach me that his ear is open to my cry. And that's when I was a brand new believer, 20 years old, and the Lord said, no, you ask, you call unto me, I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. In other words, I'm going to blow your mind. And so that's a privilege that we have. The Lord has a way of answering our prayers. And so throughout Acts, prayer is revealed as the heartbeat of the early church. The the believers would pray for miracles. They prayed for healings. They would pray for God's direction. They interceded. They prayed as they sent people on ministry trips. They prayed when they appointed elders. And sometimes when you're reading about their prayers, they're just praising and thanking God as they pray. Now, I want to give you an example of this by turning you to chapter 4 here in Acts. And let me show you a few things about prayer that we find as an example in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. In Acts chapter 4, let me read to you beginning at verse 23. Being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard it, when they heard that, they ra- heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look. Look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I'll look at the first portion of verse 32. The multitude multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. I want to look at this with you for just a moment. Just to give you a background, by the time you get into chapter 4, verse 23, there are things that have already been reported Uh, that you probably would want to be aware of as we look to use this as an example of what caused them to pray. There had been a great miracle that had been performed. There was a man who had been crippled for over 40 years. It's recorded in Acts chapter 3 as well as into chapter 4. And he had been miraculously healed. When this man was miraculously healed, 
that caused a great stir among the people. And they were, according to chapter 3, verse 11, exceedingly amazed. Now, these people witnessed a miracle. But even though they had witnessed this incredible miracle, this man who couldn't walk was suddenly walking, leaping, and praising God, even though they had witnessed this incredible miracle, they remained unsaved. And, and the reason that they remain unsaved is this. We need to just remember this. Miracles by themselves do not automatically save people. Jesus performed many works, but the people didn't always come to trust in him. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 12, 24, it reads, The Pharisees said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And so just because he did some powerful work doesn't mean that people automatically will receive him as Lord and Savior. You see, miracles uh, were intended to draw the attention of people so they could hear the message of salvation. And so Peter had insisted on preaching, both he and John, and they were placed in custody. The next day, if you were to read this, the next day they were brought before the Jewish high, the high court called the Sanhedrin. It, it says in chapter 4, verse 10, that as he stood before the Sanhedrin, Peter gave glory to Jesus for the miracle. And he reminds them that it was they who had condemned Jesus to death. Now, he wasn't condemning them in a judgmental way. It was really a call for them to be accountable for their actions. Well, as he's speaking to them, and they have this notable miracle before them, uh, they don't really know what to do. So their solution was to command them to be quiet. But that wasn't possible. How do you get quiet about what you're seeing God do? You just can't. And, and that's why it says in verse 18 of chapter 4, they called them, commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Somebody says, Pastor David, can we have classes on how to give away our faith? And the answer is we do have classes to help you to learn to share your faith. Of course we do. But you have the power of the Holy Spirit, and you've seen God do things, and you've heard plenty of Bible studies. You know how to do it. If you simply open your mouth, watch what God will do. And that's what they were doing. They were simply reporting what was very obvious, at least to them. Well, there was nothing they could do except to threaten them and release them. That's what it says in verse 21. So in verse 23, it says, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Now, after a night in jail, and after boldly preaching, they had to be physically drained. So what do they do to recover their strength? I want you to notice, they lifted up their voices in prayer. Let's look at how they prayed. This gives to us an example. In verse 24, when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord. So one, in prayer, they prayed in one accord. They fervently took the problem to their heavenly Father. Together, these believers raised their voices to God with great fervor. They raised their voices. It has been said a prayer that is not felt is seldom heard. And so they prayed with great fervor. They raised their voices to God. Why? Because God is their Father and God cares for them. When we are saved, we have a personal relationship with a heavenly Father. Father, and we cry out to him. We cry out with our needs, with our concerns, with our sorrows, with our hurts, and he hears. And he hears us. James tells us in chapter 5, verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Psalm 130, verses 1 and 2, out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Some things, let me talk to you about this for just a moment. Some things can drive us to our knees, and some things can compel us to cry out with great emotion to God. There are some things that we experience that can cause many sleepless nights. They can cause in our life things that are so deeply painful that we don't know how to deal with it. That there could be sorrow and there can be grief that is so immense. So immense.
that it drives us to God. There are things, there are things, not everybody, I have to be careful because I always assume every, everybody has gone through things like deep loss and all, and I, I think that's a human condition, and if we haven't yet, we will. We will. Sometimes when we haven't, we don't understand those who have. Sometimes, sometimes when we have, gone through something deep, we really don't have anybody around us who understands what we're going through. Anybody here understand what I just said? There's times. There's times. It's, it's not that you're looking for some human kind of help, but it's nice to have somebody who can say, been there, done that, understand it, God will be with you. That's, there's so much comfort sometimes in the fellowship of suffering where somebody's able to put their arm around you and say, you know what, been there, walk through that valley, God is with you, and I'll be with you too. But you call on him. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He will never disappoint you. How do you know? I've been where you're at. It doesn't require that I experience everything that you have. Of course, we all have our own types of pain. But I can say this, God is with you. That, that happens. And, and, and it, it's, you're not weak when it does. And you're not a bad Christian when you hurt. I think that sometimes we who love the Lord the most can be the most disappointed sometimes. Because it causes us great confusion. Because, But Lord, I thought. And in, it's, it's Jesus' words, I memorized these a long time ago. He said, what I'm doing now you don't understand, but you will later. But you will later. There are things that he teaches you sometimes through the crucible of suffering that you don't even realize you're learning until later on you say, so that's why you allowed that in my life. So that's why. So I could be able to help others. So I wouldn't have this self-righteousness. Listen, the church sometimes has this incredible, incredible sense of, of, of inability to, to weep with those who weep. I was given a message one time, many years ago now, I was given a message, and in the message I said something or other that triggered a response of some man, an older man, and, and I still remember he was off to my right. I still remember as I heard him, and, and a sob came, it came from deep within. It's one of those, those cries that come from the, the deep part of you, and, and, it, and, it, and I heard it, it came out in such a, a painful way. I'll, I'll never forget that. Because right behind him, two young people stood immediately, walked out, and hurried out the doors and left. It disturbed them so badly when this man did what he did. It scared them. I ran off the stage myself. No, uh, <laughs> it scared them. Later on, I was told that his son had died. And I had said something in my message that drew that pain out of him. It drew the pain out of him. And he couldn't help himself. Listen, if you can't cry in church, where can you cry? If you can't cry in church, where can you cry? Isn't this supposed to be a safe place for human beings to say, hey, I've been hurt, I've been bruised, I've been broken, I've been messed up, I'm hurting? I'm alone? If you can't do it here, why can you do it? And you know what? Crying isn't bad, and it isn't a lack of faith. It's human, and my Savior Jesus wept. I guess I can too. I guess I can too. But it's not hopeless. It's not a hopeless. See, I make my cries to the Lord and he hears me, and he hears me, and he soothes. In Psalm 77, verses 1 through 4, it's a psalm of Asaph. He says, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. 
You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled, I cannot speak. You ever been there? If you haven't, you will. If you haven't, you will. And that's when you discover that there's nothing so deep that you go through that God isn't deeper still. Your, his, under, his, his hands are underneath you, lifting you up. And you will discover that. And you will praise and love God deeper than ever before because he never left you and he never forsook you. He was there with you all the time. He has your tears in a bottle and he remembers. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. So we pray, what a privilege to be able to come to my father who understands and to say this is where my heart is right now and to know that he welcomes me in. You know, you can pray for things like, God, I'm lonely. Or God, help my marriage. God, help my children. God, touch my grandchild. God, be with my parents, my friends. And sometimes it can be so overwhelming that you want to give up. The psalmist said three words that I want to give to you before I move on. Three words that you might want to remember. Psalm 18, verse 46, the Lord lives. The Lord lives. In the midst of your loneliness, the Lord lives. In the midst of your financial stress, the Lord lives. In the midst of your child who's not doing so well, the Lord lives. In the midst of a marriage that's, that's just having so much problems right now, you're not sure what's going to happen, the Lord lives. In the midst of a time when you're looking for work and you can't, the Lord lives. He's alive and his ear is open. And don't give up hope because he's there. And he will deliver you. He will walk with you. You walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. I don't walk through this by myself. That's what keeps me going. I'm not alone. I'm never alone. He's with me. And he's alive. They said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea. Lord, you are able, you are in complete control. I can trust you. The, the word Lord is a word that speaks of an absolute master. You are in complete control. Everything, including my own suffering, is within your will. You're in control of all events, and therefore I trust you. I can trust you to do what is right. When you pray, be aware of the fact that God is aware of your situation. And when you pray, remember to trust him no matter what the outward circumstances may be. In verses 25 through 28, they appealed to scripture. They prayed with knowledge concerning God's will for them. That's why, again, it's so important to know your scripture that you can pray according to it. They, they said, who by the mouth of your servant David has said. So opposition was foreseen in scripture, so it should not come as a surprise to them. Even though enemy joins forces, they can only accomplish what God has determined. And you need to remember that in your spiritual warfare, you fight from the position of the victor, not the victim. You see, prayer is not trying to get God on my side. Prayer is me moving on to his side. And I use the scripture to guide me as I pray. In verses 29 and 30, they pray with boldness. They say, look on their threats. Grant to your servants that we might have boldness. They prayed with boldness. They prayed with faith because they knew that God would move on their behalf. They're not saying we need a place to hide. They're saying we need courage to continue. We've received orders. We have a great commission. And we want to be faithful to that. Somebody has asked me in the past, and even recently it has been asked many times, what, what gives, gave you the boldness to share the gospel with your family? Why did you do it? And the reason I did it is real simple. I believed what God said, and I acted on what I believed. The gospel is truth. Truth sets men free. And boldness is simply a combination of God's word, God's spirit, obedience, and just acting on it. It goes on in verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. The result is a visit of God's power. They were filled with the spirit. They spoke God's word with boldness. The persecution refined them, 
and thrust them on the one who could and would help them. And so what happens, verse 32, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Wherever the Spirit of God moves, there's going to be unity. There's going to be concern for others. Here in this fellowship, and I'll close with some practical things for you. There are opportunities to put this Bible study into practice. You can do it immediately. We'll be doing it in a moment when we close with prayer. But for those of you who would like to pursue becoming more and more involved as people who pray, here in our fellowship, we have what we call our men of prayer. Our men of prayer every Sunday will meet it in room 523 from 7 to 8 a.m., and they pray. We have couples ministry prayer the first Sunday of the month in room 405 during first service. We have women's intercessory prayer every Monday in room 524 from 9 to 11 a.m. We have compassion ministry prayer every Thursday in room 522 from 10 a.m. to noon. We have Friday night prayer meetings on the last Friday of the month in room 524 from 7 to 9.30. We have missions prayer and updates quarterly the first Sunday of the month in room 305 after third service. We have prayer that's going on right now as I'm teaching. And we have as a, an, as a church the opportunity to gather for prayer on the National Day of Prayer on May 7th in the Chino City Hall at 1145. And if you can't make it, then we'll be here at 7 p.m. that night. Somebody said this, and I'll close with a couple last words. This is something to think about. The first prayer, it would seem, that is recorded in the Bible is when Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He wasn't talking to himself. He was speaking to the Lord. That's your first prayer is Adam as he was blessing God that God gave him a woman. And I'm pretty certain he prayed for the rest of his life because God had given to him <laughs> a woman. That's a good prompt for prayer. But what is interesting is the last promise in prayer that you find in Scripture is Revelation 22, verse 20, where it says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. There's your promise. And the prayer, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I am coming quickly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Someone asked the question, what does it say about our churches today that God birthed the church in a prayer meeting and prayer meetings today are almost extinct? Think about that. The church was birthed in a prayer meeting. But if you have a prayer meeting, many people are too busy to pray. Is it a small wonder that this nation is in such bad condition when the church has forgotten the power of prayer and has forgotten the power of the God that we worship who answers prayer? It's an earmark of a believer to talk to the Lord, to have that moment with God. Please feel free to exercise that privilege. Talk to him often.